think it probably started um, with this conversation I had with my dad over dinner, um, a kind of um, celebratory um, occasion, a kind of uh, holiday dinner. And, uh, you know, when my dad and I are talking, we often talk about our careers and about work, him as a photographer and his, his print sales and book sales around photography and me around my academic work quite often. And um, so I was chatting with him. And when I chat with him, I often go off in different directions. And, um, but it did come up that I wanted to do something around life or death typography. And that was the phrasing that I used to talk about it with him. And as soon as I said life or death typography, his eyes lit up. And he said, Thomas, life or death typography, you should, you should spend the next year devoted to life or death typography. When I heard him have that kind of um, passion or that kind of enthusiasm around the words life or death typography, I thought, how can I get him off my back? How can I you know, spend a week and churn something out that will allow me to get to the next thing? The week passed and months passed and I realized that I wasn't going to be able to get away from this idea. I was going to have to explore it and embrace it. And, um, you know, just today um, coming, coming here to SFU and um, being on the mountain and walking through the trails, I was, I was kind of letting the idea stir a bit and, um, and I was realizing the importance of the content aspect of life or death typography. You know, I wrote this essay about typography, which was published um, through, through Richard and through the BC Review. And um, that piece um, got shared. I ended up being invited to, to Paris, to the Sorbonne, to, to read from that essay. And that was just a, a few months ago. And, um, and that um, piece that I read there was essentially about life or death typography. And in addition to that, uh, I have a good friend who's a type designer named Keith Tam, who um, I met during my undergrad at Emily Carr, um, studying typography there, and uh, he invited me on his podcast. And the prompt for our podcast recording was saving lives and typography saving lives. And clearly, he had thought that that was um, among the pieces of content that I share. That was going to be the one that was going to hit home. And so we spent about an hour talking about it and. Um, you know, um, again, in the back of my head, I was thinking about my dad and investing a year of my life in this thing and invested an hour of conversation about it with Keith and came to the realization that I can't write a book about this. There's not enough information to do that. Um, and that's what I really believed at that time. But as things evolved, as the Sorbonne happened, as the journey around life or that typography started to happen, as the content started to um, elaborate itself and to, 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 to become more, at least in terms of the exposure it was getting, I started to realize that this was something that I was going to slowly, even if it was happening very slowly, I was going to have to slowly be able to talk about and um, come back to, and you know, as you and I have talked about, um, there are applications like highway signage, like pill bottles, um, like instructions, like election ballots that are all typography and they're very critical in, in their applications. Typography is language made visible. This is the description of it. So. Um, you know, when you're thinking about any sort of reading, any sort of, and not just reading, but um, as you read the environment, the physical environment, the logos you see, the signage you see around you, it's all kind of resonating on you and it's kind of impacting you in this way. And it's making you make certain decisions, it's making you feel certain emotions, um, and it's making you navigate your day-to-day -day in a certain way. It's a very kind of subconscious thing that happens um, that the typography um, does to cast this magic spell on you. Let's say Helvetica. You know, Helvetica is a font. It had its relevance during every time period. Um, you know, in the 70s, it was used 
um, for Coca-Cola advertisements to um, say how refreshing and clean and clear Coke was as a kind of escape from this visual language before then in the 50s and 60s that had been very decorative and elaborate. And to escape that with this simplicity uh, allowed, it, allowed Helvetica to, to, to feel clean and clear and refreshing and, and all of the good things that you wanted that you never had then. These days you might think of it as something on a, uh, a printed out, you know, bubble jet printed um, out of service sign for a bathroom door at a restaurant or something like that. Um, you might think of it as a, a default font when you don't want to say anything and you just want to um, set something in a sans serif. I'll give another example, which would be Comic Sans. Um, Comic Sans is, has a bad name and it's the one that throughout time we always laughed about. Comic Sans was made for comic books, to, to look like comic books. And I always say if your application is not a comic book, then why would you use Comic Sans? And it's this kind of idea that if you use something for the, if you use a font for the purpose that it's meant to be used for, then in a way it has a certain rightness to it. And when it's used not in the right way or in a confusing way or a, a, a difficult to understand way, then it takes us time to, to allow it to resonate with us. So you can imagine, you know, you're driving down the street and you look at a road signage that's set in Comic Sans and maybe you double take, right? And when you double take, you, uh, your eyes leave the road because you're confused about the font. We don't think of it that way yet, I don't think, as ordinary people driving down the road. We don't think we're interpreting the font, but we are. And, it, and our, um, our reaction to it can be very critical. It can, it can really shape what happens. I mean, car accident, potentially. Um, and then with the Helvetica, um, you know, does something sell or doesn't it? If it's edgy and cool, maybe it does. And if it's not, maybe it doesn't. And, if you are wearing the American Apparel clothing, you're perceived in a certain way, and it's the, the Helvetica, it's the font that's creating that perception. Times New Roman, you know, such an academic um, pillar that we all use, you know, 12 point double space Times New Roman, it's the default, it's the convention, and we all understand it, and when we see it, we, we kind of have a certain relief. It's like a familiarity. It's like, oh, okay, I know what this is already. Um, does it need to be changed? Absolutely. And, you know, um, the design schools that are doing the right thing are getting the students to shake things up a bit. And, you know, names like David Carson, who's uh, very well known, even beyond the graphic design world, or was at least when I was growing up, was definitely trying to shake things up and definitely saying that legibility and readability can be more and can be different than the way that we look at them. Um, you know, um, but on the other hand, what is the trade-off? You know, if we uh, look at an academic paper and it's set in Comic Sans, is that what kind of impression will that set? Um, uh, will we lose that necessary fam immediate familiarity with that paper that we would have with the Times New Roman? and look at it and think, what is this? Is this even a paper? Do you know what I mean? I've had conversations around this. I've argued that even color, the color red, the color green can um, be typography. Um, and, you know, some people would argue that that's maybe visual communication, communication design, graphic design. And I would argue that <laughs> the pillar of graphic design and communication design, that is typography. So when you talk about color or when you talk about white space and negative space, um, when you talk about um, grids, when you talk about even motion, motion graphics, trailers for a film, um, motion on, on your iPhone, uh, all of those things are typography in many ways. And I think not everybody has 
come to terms with that in the way that maybe is necessary. Um, you know, the, the, the future of typography um, has the potential to um, um, really shape things because typography is so rich in history and so uh, rich in, in vocabulary. And, you know, as we move to the future with typography, I think uh, we, there's, there's this necessity or this opportunity to, to, to take advantage of all that vast knowledge and use it in a way um, that, can, that can dictate aspects of our future um, for the better. Um, I do think, you know, I mean, it's sounding obvious and it is obvious that I, I really believe in the design history aspect of typography and the rich vastness of it as an area of academic exploration in many ways and um, sometimes I wonder why it isn't focused on more um, you know in uh, art school maybe it is but then when you move to the broader universities they, they teach you architecture but maybe they don't teach you typography and sometimes I wonder why that is. Mm -hmm.